So good evening, everyone. I want to say thank you for being here. I truly, truly appreciate it. I know, um, and, and Rick, um, Ed, um, we all know that you've probably got better things to be doing on a Tuesday night. So I don't want to waste your time. I want to get right into this. And this is the only slide that you're going to see tonight. And even though this was kind of funny, um, it, it has a serious, um, a serious thought behind it. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is how important it is to have a trade plan, to know what you're going to do. And, you know, one of the things that I run into a lot when I'm coaching, when I'm working with someone, is we give lip service to the idea of trade planning, but we don't really do it, right? And people wonder why they're struggling and having so much trouble and losing more than they expect, and it's because we're working so hard to stay busy, we're not actually solving our problems by doing a little bit of trade planning. Does that make sense, guys? I mean, we're just rushing, rushing, rushing all the time. Hurry, hurry. I don't have time to do this. When it, it can save you a lot of time and money in the long run if you just do it. Okay, so let's talk about that for just a, a little bit. Let's have a discussion as to what that means, putting together a plan. First, I'm going to talk, and the reason this came up is I had quite a few questions about this the other day, and I haven't done a class on this for a while, so I thought it might be a good idea to just refresh some of this information and see if we can... Um, uh, well, um, get newer folks up to speed. So let me ask you this, guys. Um, if you're, you're taking a look at, um, at your trading and you don't have any plan at all, one of the first things you need to start thinking about is how you're going to allocate your money. Right? Because I, I get that question all the time, too. How much should I put toward a trade? What do I need to do here to allocate my money correctly? Okay? And all that usually starts off with a goal of some kind. I'm going to use $20,000 just because it's just a nice round number, easy to figure. Okay? If you have an account of 20 k Okay. I'm just going to ask you guys, what's a good rate of return by the end of the year? If at the end of the year, what would you, what would make you feel like a hero that you've done something pretty special in the year? If you've grown your account, what would do that? <clears throat> and you want to be realistic because if you set expectations way too high, you're only going to disappoint yourself right? I get this comment all the time. Well, I want, uh, you know, I have a $5,000 account. I want this account to be $40,000 at the end of the year. Well, do you think they're setting themselves up to fail if you do that kind of thing? I mean, how many, how many money managers out there can do that over and over and over, year after year after year. Okay? Not very many people can do that. So I'm going to use, I see 20% in there, 25%. I'm going to use 20. It, well, Bob Ass has, has kind of been in the financial industry for a while. Okay, had some experience out there in the financial field. Bob, how many money managers do you know can make a 20% return year over year or have proven that they can keep a 20% return year over year? Yeah, it's almost zero that can do that year over year over year. It doesn't happen. Okay. Um. It's it's a rare thing to see, Jim Cramer. <laughs> In his dreams, maybe. <laughs> so.
So let's talk about how we can do that. So I'm going to use $20,000 uh, in here. And um, if we if we have $20,000, that means we need to make $4,000 a year. And I know you guys think, oh, this is just stupid. I got to go through this process. Yes, you do. And if you have a smaller account, you really need to do this. And if you ignore this step, you, you're messed up from the beginning. Yeah, Bernie Madoff, he, he, he pulled it off. <laughs> he pulled it off. <clears throat> okay. So if we're trying to make $4,000 a year, what's that? If that's our annual goal, what do we need to do? on a monthly basis. Well, if we divide that by 12, we need to make somewhere around, and I'm just gonna round this up, it's $333.33. So I'm just gonna say we need we need 335 bucks. 335 per month. Now, why is that important? Everybody looks at that 335 and says, well, geez, that's not enough money. I can't live on that, and that's right. You can't live on that. If you have a $20,000 account and you think you're going to live on that account, you're only fooling yourself and you're more likely to end up losing all of your money than you are growing it. If you go with the attitude that I can make a full-time living on a $20,000 account. It's not going to happen. You can grow it. You can have great results. You can have all kinds of success but you won't live out of a $20,000 account. And I hate to burst people's bubble, but that's the fact. It's not going to happen. You cannot. The only way you could maybe do that is risk it all, all the time. And how many people in here are willing to risk it all, all the time? Anybody? Probably not, right? We're not that kind. That's how, how most of us aren't built that way, where we can risk everything all at the same time, that we can throw all in into a trade. Okay, so we need to have steady, repeatable goals. We need to have that plan that's going to move us along. Okay. So if we need to make $335 a month, does that seem overwhelming? No, that seems pretty pretty easy. If we're holding a $20,000 account and we initially say, I need to make $4,000 this year, and you have never seen that any year prior, that right there seems impossible. You want it, but if you've never done it in the past... How's that going to be achieved if you don't change something? Okay. You got to change. So let's think about this. Let's think about this number. This is what we need to achieve on a monthly basis. Did anyone think you can find a trade, a trade that can make you $335? Most people in here are probably going to say, yeah, I could probably find a trade that has the potential to do that. Now, we're not going to take just one trade. We're going to break this down. Anybody in here think that you trade? How, how often do you trade? Three to four trades a, a week? Maybe more? If you trade three to four trades a week, How much do you make on, need to make on each one of those trades to make 335 happen? And before you answer that, I want to ask you this question. Is it easier? Do you think it's going to be easier to find one trade that makes you 335? Or 12 trades that makes you 50 bucks? Twelve, right? 
Now, if you made, if you had a goal to say, hey, every trade, I want to try and make $50, we know some of those trades are going to lose. But if we have that goal that every trade that we make, we try to make at least 50 bucks or whatever your number is. Remember, I'm just using this $20,000 as an example. If you only won half of those trades, you would come close to your goal, depending on what, how well you managed your losses in those positions, okay? And here's the other thing. When you know what your number is, what you're trying to achieve every month, this doesn't have to be a minimum, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a maximum. It could be the minimum. If we hit 335 in the first week, should we stop trading? No. We should keep doing the same thing over and over and over. We should keep repeating that same process, but we continue to work for that goal. That number that we're trying to hit every trade. Okay. So think about what your plan is here and how you're going to get reach what you want to reach at the end of the year. And if you don't have that plan, get it done. It doesn't take a lot of work. You can see it took a minute to figure this stuff out and now start developing that attitude or that plan that we're going to search, reach forward for this every single week every single month. We're gonna keep reaching out there and looking for those small attainable gains, goals, so that we can see the track record and the account growing. And if you don't do this step, if every trade you're out there just kind of winging it, guess what happens? You take trades when you shouldn't trade, you force trades, you rush trades. And what happens when you do those kind of things? Does anyone here have a win-loss ratio better than 50-50? I hope you do. Can you imagine the improvement that it makes in your trading? If you're running a 50-50 ratio in your trading, if you're running 50-50 and then all you do is cut one loser. So let's let's use 10 trades. You're winning five trades. A stupid thing keeps changing tools on me. You, you win five trades, you lose five trades. Can you imagine the massive improvement in your trading if you just remove one of those losing trades? By not pushing, by not pressing, by doing a little bit more planning, by working a little bit harder to make sure you're taking the right trade at the right time. Because if you start running 60-40, things really start to improve in your trading. Okay. KT, this is this is it. This is what we're going to do. Okay. We're going to get into the trade setups and actually planning the trade. But if you don't do this step, the rest of them won't matter. Everyone wants to rush to the end. Everyone wants, just, just show me the trade setup. That's all I want. Just give me the trade. That's not the way it works. That's not the way any business works. In any business, you walk into any bank, what's your plan to make money? How are you going to achieve that? They want to see a well thought out logical plan. If you can't produce it, see ya. They're not interested in loaning you the money. So don't jump to the end. Start working on the plan. 
plan to be successful, have a reason why you take a trade first. Okay. Now the next step, after we kind of know what our goals are, what we're trying to achieve, first off, that should take some pressure off because we're not reaching out there for a great big giant win on every trade. We're looking for consistent gains. Now, Mike Peterson just said that he has a better, better win-loss ratio than 50-50. As a matter of fact, oftentimes, Mike will show you that he's got win-loss ratios of 70% plus. How does he do that? Because he's picky about the trades he takes. Okay? He sticks to a simple set of rules. You know, one of his rules is if he, he comes up with a trade, he passes that trade by someone else, not just him. He passes that trade by someone else. He wants a second set of eyes on that trade to confirm what he's seeing is right, that he's not making a mistake. He uses me for that. He uses Rick for that. He uses other people in the room for that. Mike asks for accountability. He asks for accountability. Make me accountable. About once a month, Mike and I get together in a coaching session. We've been doing that for how long, Mike? Almost two years. And the whole prop purpose of doing that is he wants held accountable to his trade setups to make sure he's doing the right thing. Ask for accountability, guys, and expect it. Find somebody to help you stay accountable to your rules, to your guidelines. Yeah, and then it often ends, ends with a blizzard. You're right. <laughs> so have an accountability measure, okay? What's working, what's not? and have someone reviewing that information. Trade partner, friend, spouse. They don't even have to know everything they need to know. I mean, what you know about trading, but they have to understand your set of rules and whether or not you're following them. Okay. Next step, we gotta find a trade. We've gotta find a trade that's setting up, a trade that has a low risk entry point. Okay, if we look at a chart, and and I'm going to use um, I'm going to use a chart like um, uh, just the diamonds from yesterday. Ignore this today's candle. If you were trying to trade this, let's say this is X Y Z company, and you were trying to trade this, is entering this trade here a wise decision? Think about it. No, it's not. But how many in this room will admit that they've chased trades and it's cost them a lot of money? Right? I mean, both hands up for me. Both hands up for me. I have chased trades and it's cost me a whole bunch of money. And you know why that happened? because I didn't plan. Because I didn't put together a good quality plan that was low risk. If I entered this trade on this day, and I say, you know what, I can't afford to lose this money all the way back down to here, so I'm just gonna decide somewhere right in here's the stop loss. How, how, how well do you think that'll work? If you try to set a stop loss based on what feels right, not what the chart says, how do you, how do you expect that to work? You're likely to get stopped out. 
you took too much risk in the trade, you dummied up your stop loss, and all of a sudden your win-loss ratio is not 50-50, you're losing six trades to four. Because you didn't follow a simple basic set of rules, you didn't use discipline, you chased a trade. So we need to find low risk entry trades. Trades that we can put on a position, okay, that have lower risk in the trade. So there's no buy signal here on this trade. Let's assume you bought this trade yesterday. You bought this trade when this popped out. Market pulls back. Is this a major panic point for this trade? Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be a panic point because your stop loss should be underneath price support. And if you've planned your trade correctly, you can stand the risk. Okay? The risk is okay. I can take that trade because I've planned how many dollars I'm going to lose to my stop loss and it's acceptable. If you try to put together a trade and the dollars here is not acceptable, if you don't know what your risk tolerance is, that's the next step. You've got to figure out what you're willing to lose on a trade and live with it. Because does every trade work? No. Do we know? Do I know? Does Rick know every time he puts on a trade it's going to work? No. No clue whatsoever. We can't see into the future. What we can do, though, is stay disciplined to a set of rules in such a way that we minimize the risk on every trade that we take. We avoid chasing. We avoid rushing. We take the time to plan what our risk is in this trade. And if that dollar amount reaches a higher level than you're willing to accept, walk away from the trade. That's the discipline. I find trades every single day that I can't take, that don't fit me, that have too much risk, and I walk away from those trades. Okay. Now, how do you minimize risk in trades? Well, first, you minimize risk in trades by using good quality patterns. Would everyone agree? We've talked about this quite a bit here recently. Um, would everyone agree the most repeatable patterns in the market are stocks move up in a peak and valley pattern, right? Or stocks move up and they consolidate. Two of the most repeatable patterns in the market. Okay. <clears throat> How many of you do this? Stock has been falling and gosh, it really went really far down. And right here, there's a white candle. How many of you jump on that trade and think that that makes sense? Is that a low risk entry? Well, it could be. Stop loss could be right there, but does that make sense? No, because there's no pattern here except a downtrend. And how many of you will admit to yourself that one of the things that's caused you a lot of problems is trying to pick the bottom? Trying to trade a stock that's trading in a downtrend. Trying to get the early entry. I'm telling you guys, stop that and your win-loss ratio will marginally improve. Remember, it doesn't take much 
to improve that win-loss ratio to a point that you're making some serious money because the majority of your trades are winning. Stop making the mistakes that continue to cost you that win-loss ratio. Be pickier about the trades you take. Now, I ask this question of people all the time. First thing that has to happen for me to take a trade, if I'm in a trade long, stock has to be in a trend. How do we know if a stock's in a trend? Makes a first higher low, right? But what if the long term, longer term downtrend doesn't get it, doesn't get resolved until right here? I don't trade this one either. I wait till the long term downtrend is breached and support has been held and proved, and then buyers step in. Then I take that trade. I'm picky about the trades I take. So let me ask you a question. If you go back to this chart right here, can you take this trade, this candle right here? Is that an acceptable entry into the trade? Can you take that trade? Awesome. That's what we want to take, right? We want to take that chart that's moved up, held support, and proven that it's starting to trend. That we have a technically correct pattern. Okay? But how many of you will admit that you're caught in this a lot? Stocks pulls back, finds this level of support, that big candle comes in, and the first thing you do is jump on it. Is that a technically correct pattern? It's not a technically correct, correct pattern. What's happened here that makes that an incorrect pattern? Price broke support and all this was was a rally back to resistance. Guys, I got to tell you, one of the biggest problems I had when I was, uh, I struggled with this for years, and it, it was one of those things that I just couldn't get through my thick head. I was constantly buying stocks at price resistance. I would see this bottom pattern. I mean, by the way, isn't that pretty much a morning star signal in there? Isn't that kind of the pattern that you see in the books? Oh my gosh, bulls are coming. I, I got to buy this. It's right off of this support level. Right. And the reason I know this happens is because people show me these charts all the time. They post the ticker. What do you think of this chart? Um, no, that's what I think about that chart. No. Okay. We have to think about the pattern that we're in. We have to think about the position that we're trading. Okay, so beat that, beat that to death enough. Now let's talk about the actual planning. Okay, finding those good trades. First, we want a trend, right? We want to trade with the trend of the market. Market's trending up. We predominantly want to be trading up. Market's trending down. We want to predominantly be trading down until those trends break. Stay with the trend of the market. It's the easiest way to make money. Second, we wanna find those technically correct patterns. We know our rules, we know our risk tolerance because we've already planned that and we know how much we need to try and make on a trade. Okay, so if we find this trade, and we put a plan together, our plan tells us this is where our stop is. We know our stop before we enter the trade. You should never make a trade until you know where the stop is and one step further, know how much risk you're taking on the trade. How many of you will admit that you've taken a trade and all of a sudden the stock starts pulling back 
and the losses in that trade are much larger than you expected. Doesn't even seem like the stock could have pulled back that much already. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I have, I, I've done it more times than I care to admit. And that's my failure. And see, what, we'll, what we like to do as traders is we like to blame it on somebody else. Well, I'd have made money on it if the president would have just shut his, his trap. I would have made money on it if, if they'd have just listened to me at the FOMC. I would have made money on it if, 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 if. We blame it on everyone else, and then we don't accept the responsibility that we didn't plan the trade to begin with. We didn't understand the risk before we entered the trade, and the market taught us another lesson. But if we blame it on someone else rather than taking that internally and saying, look, I got to stop this, I got to stop breaking this rule. If you don't, if you're constantly trying to push that blame off onto somebody else, guess what happens? You never learn anything. You don't accept responsibility. And you're destined to repeat that over and over and over. Bob S., yes. Know and accept your loss before you enter the trade. You can't make a trade without putting a whole bunch of motion, emotion into that trade unless you know how much you're risking on the trade. You'll always be an emotional mess over a trade if you don't have a plan, if you don't know how much you're risking. Okay, now I have a rule, and you guys can you know figure out your own rule on this. I know this right from the get-go. If a stock has moved more than 6% before I see the move, Ain't no chance in the world I'm going to take that trade. Because I know if it's already moved up 6%, my stop loss is probably 8 or 10% away. I just mark up that chart, put it in a list, and wait for the next entry. I'm no longer tempted to chase that trade because I know the risk is too much right from the get-go. Okay? I'm not going to chase. Okay, so how is it, if I'm this picky on trades, how is it that I find so many trades? Because I follow the rules that I talk about all the time. I build a watch list of qualified stocks. Stocks that fit, they have good options, they have good prices. There, and I and I manage that list. Right from my list right here of my alerts, you can see what I'm doing. This is out of my watch list. These are my alerts. You can see LMT is right here in the list because I have an alert on that trade. And that's one of the ways you minimize the risk of a trade is you look for that trade before it occurs. How many of you feel like you're always rushing? You're always hurrying. There's just never enough time. You're rushing, rushing, rushing because you're always chasing a trade that's already moved. I look at charts and prepare ahead of time. So for example, if you look at Ford, this pink line up here is an alert. I'm waiting for this stock to come to me. I don't chase it. I don't try to find it in the middle of the day after it's already moved. I want it to alert and get that lower risk entry into that trade. Same thing is true, SNPS. 
Everyone knows I've been alerting people about this for quite some time. Keep an eye on SNPS. PepsiCo. Because I'm preparing ahead of time. If you want to get some of the most low risk entries into trades, prepare ahead of time. We made a real fun trade here just recently on Apple, right there. And everyone in Right Way Options had an opportunity to get into that because I alerted on the trade here. My risk in this trade is low. The person who waits for this thing to already move and then tries to discover it, ends up taking the trade up here and risking double what I risk. in the trade. Because I plan ahead of time. I want the low risk entry. I don't want to chase the trade. I want the trade to come to me. Okay. <clears throat> How do I draw these, the, the arrows that I'm drawing? Is that what you're asking, Chad? Or the lines that I put on my chart? TC2000 has all the line tools and everything on there. It's easy to do. I'm, you're asking, how do I find the locations? First thing I do is I, I look at the chart. What did I say about trends? First off, I want a stock that's breaking its downtrend. I want a stock that's proving an uptrend. And as long as an uptrend is in place, I just wait for the next entry into the trade. Literally, that's what I do, guys. I, I've made a career out of waiting for the next entry into a trade on a stock that's trending. And those two patterns that I said are the most repeatable patterns are the trades I make. Either the pullback opportunity, there was the alert right there, that pink line. Or the move up and consolidation over, and there was the alert, the pink line. Okay. Yeah, the same thing is true in a downtrend. What you're going to find in a downtrend is there's a lot more volatility, but it's still, it's still very doable in the trade. We're always looking for that trend and that retest of resistance. Wait for the retest of resistance. Instead of buying at resistance, we sell at resistance. And then we look for that failure pattern to enter those trades. Same thing is true. And all you have to do is put an alert in there, right? I need an alert. We hit resistance. If we fail, let me know. Okay. On SNPS, you think the trend is broken? Well, first off, <laughs> When you draw a trend like this, is it is it a perfect line? Do you think I, 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 when I draw a trend line, most people see me do these very, very quickly. I'm not trying to pick the perfect. It, are you telling me that if we move it like that, this is no longer trending if we get a buy signal in here? See what I'm saying? If we get a buy signal in there, would you trade that? Well, heck yeah, right? Now, one other point. What if it just continues to go sideways here? Goes out here for a long, long ways and breaks this trend. As long as it stays in a consolidation and nobody wants to sell it, I'm going to be interested in that chart. Because it may just needed a rest to allow 
all the older, all the moving averages or something to start catching up. It may have just extended too far too fast, needs an additional rest period, and then it resumes its trend. Okay, yeah, like GIS. It just needed, it needed more time. Nothing wrong with that trade. It's still holding support. It just needed more time. There's nothing bad about this chart yet. But we do have to wait for the signal, right? We can't predict the signal. If the signal occurs right in here, if I get that buy signal that perks up here, that'd be a big buy signal right there, wouldn't it? If I got that, isn't that a trend? A higher low? Breaking through resistance? Why wouldn't I want to take that trade? My stop loss under this consolidation is very tight. I have a low risk entry into the trade. Okay. So let's talk about these trades. How can we put together these positions so readily? Well, if we're waiting for the trade to come to us, can't we be kind of prepared? How many took STZ right here when I told everybody it alerted? Right way options, folks. There's quite a few folks that made money on this. I even put that out in my morning video. Uh, Rick M, no, the buy signal is not necessarily the high, not necessarily the higher low. It's the higher low that's responding in a pattern. It's responding to re support. It's responding to a tight consolidation. It's responding to the trend. Okay. If I have a trend that's here, the stock's been moving along up this move. All of a sudden it gets a move like that, has a little pull back and shows, shows a white candle. Is that a buy signal? It might be, it might be that the stock has just changed its trajectory. But if there's no price support in here anywhere, if this is floating out here in the middle of mid air, you've got to be really cautious with this trade versus this trade, right? Down here. Because we have all seen this occur, right? Where the stock pops up and then just goes right back down. We saw that yesterday in the diamonds. What was the key problem here? Well, first off, we failed a high, we made a lower high, And no one wanted to recognize that as a lower high. All we wanted to do was believe that the stock had to come back up because we needed it to go back up because we were long stocks. Has to go back up. No, it doesn't. What we failed to recognize is that we rallied right into resistance. Is this a technically correct pattern to trade? Should we be rushing long into that trade? Nope. 
the pattern's not correct, right? How do we know it's a technically correct pattern? It moves up, sets a higher low, somewhere near trend, somewhere near support, and buyers step in. There's no technically correct pattern here. Okay, so you guys got to, um, everyone, and this is for everyone, got to familiarize yourself with the patterns. Let, let's do this, for example. Let's say a stock has been going along, clipping along here that had a little level of support here and then failed through there, comes right back up here and pops back through. Is that a technically correct pattern? No, that's a chase. If you chase into this anywhere below that high up there, you run the risk of that pulling back. But we do that all the time, right? We see that first candle or a couple, three candles and they're perking up there. Hey, I got to hurry up and get into that trade only to get, get caught in the pullback. And the reason I know this, guys, is because I did it for so long. I literally had a complex about these trades because I thought someone had to be watching me because every time I pulled the trigger on the trade, it pulled back. And I would blame it on everything and everybody that I could think of. It couldn't be me. Why is it that every time I pull the trigger on the trade, it fails? It can't be me. Um, yeah, it can be. It was. I was consistently taking trades that wasn't technically correct. So a question everyone has to ask themselves, are you a, are you a technical trader or not? If you're a technical trader, why would you take technically incorrect trades? And do it over and over and over and repeat it over and over and over. See, if we take a technically correct trade, we have higher odds of a win. Not a guaranteed win. We have higher odds of a win. Did Apple look like a pretty high odd winning trade when we took that, when that crossed? Pretty darn high, right? Broke above resistance right here, moved over, consolidated to the trend. Nobody wanted to sell it. Came right off of the trend. Buyer stepped in. And even if the trade hadn't worked, we had low risk in the trade because our stop loss was right underneath this consolidation. So we take low risk in the position from our entry. And the only reason we know that that's the case is because we plan these video trades. We plan these trades. Yes, if you go into the um, right way options e-learning page, there's two videos in there on price patterns. And we talked a lot about the entries, the buy signals, those kind of things um, in those two videos. I, I would recommend you view those. It's in the Right Way Options archive. Okay. Is this making some sense, guys? So if you have a risk tolerance of 150 bucks, I can lose 150 bucks on a trade and you plan this trade here, no matter how perfect this is, Rick is telling everybody about it. Doug is telling everybody about it. Um, we have half a dozen people in the room talking about this trade and you put together this trade and this trade is going to cost you $250 risk. Do you take this trade? No. Walk away from the trade. The trade is not for you.
That's right, Alan. Have a set of rules. Have the discipline to maintain your rules. If you were in any other business, walked into a bank and said, hey, I know this is double the risk and I can really afford, but would you back me on this? Do you think there's a banker in the world that would say, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. We, Yeah, we got this. Please. That's not going to happen, but we do that to ourselves all the time. We take trades that we can't afford. We can't stand the heat, and so consequently, when the stock starts pulling back, we panic. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever taken a trade? Get into the position. The stock pulls back. You close this trade. Even though it's still holding above support. And nothing has changed in this trend. But you close this trade because this risk was more than you expected. And then right after you get out of the trade, the trade goes up. Isn't that almost worse than a losing trade? First you got you, you you got the losing trade. And then you broke your set of rules, didn't have a plan, and then watched that trade go up from there. It destroys your confidence. It's a killer. Right? So every trade needs to be planned with an idea of how much risk you can take and how much risk you can stand. And if the stock pulls back, we cannot micromanage that position unless something fundamentally has changed in the market or, or something along like, you know, like the trade war. Okay, if I'm in a long trade. Will I close those trades if I feel like there's a fundamentally different, more risk because of the trade war? Absolutely, I'm out. I'll take the small loss. And I'll wait in the trade. But unless there's some fundamental change that really changes up the market, you should stay with your trade plan. Because if you've accepted this risk and you understand this risk that you've taken, it's acceptable. Then allow price support and allow trend to do their job. And wait for the trade to respond to those. Don't micromanage it. Second guess it. Stay with the position. Okay. So when you look at these charts that are in this list, not all of these charts work. Everyone knows that I had a possible alert setting up here on Boeing. Can you see the pattern? Hold a support, hold a support, higher, low, consolidation, over to trend. I was waiting for a buy signal that never occurred. Here's the next real important point. Don't anticipate the trade. We're always impatient, right? We want to find a trade today. And so we try to predict and anticipate the trade. I can tell you guys that has cost me so much money over my lifetime as a trader because I tried to predict when it was going to turn. Wait for the proof. That's all you got to do. Just wait for the buyers to step in and prove that they want to start taking it up. It doesn't mean when you do that that it's going to guarantee a winner because we could pop up like this, turn around, and come back down. But at least we waited for good 
quality signal. Now, more often than not, when this happens, this will hold this area as support, even if it pulls back, and we will eventually make our way higher. That's why you have to have a plan. If I enter that candle, my stop loss under here, I have to hold that plan. If it has to consolidate more, if it has to pull back more, it's okay, I'll wait for it. Okay, is this stuff making sense? But the only way we're going to know if a trade is acceptable is if we plan it. And like I said, we, we, we give it lip service all the time, right? As traders, yeah, I plan my trades. All right, how much you have risk on this trade? Well, I don't know. No, your trade's not planned. You've just taken risk in a trade that you don't understand. Consequently, you're emotional. You didn't make a business decision. You made emotional decision. You know, when I got into business in, in construction, went on my own. I couldn't go out and start building um, apartment complexes when I started. I couldn't stand the risk of that. I had to take the small projects. A lot of the projects that nobody wanted to take. Because I had to build my skill, my confidence, my ability, grow the business to where I could take the risk of the bigger job. Same thing is true in training. You have to grow to that larger position. You have to grow to that larger stock. You can't start out at zero and expect to be that great trader taking those big risks in those positions. I use this statement I, when I do coaching and people have paid me for coaching and um, I try to be very direct. I don't try to be mean or anything like that, but I try to be very direct and helpful with folks in thinking about these, these issues, okay? And I'll tell people with a small account that they need to plan their trades. And I've actually even had people tell me well you know that's for people with a lot of money that's not for me no that's really for you the smaller your account the more precise the more precision you don't have any flexibility you have to be on top of it all the time Because when you break a rule, it can destroy you. But people with small accounts want to, well, that's not for me. And you guys have heard me say this before. If you're not willing to change, if you, if you understand that these rules are important and you're not willing to change, do me a favor Write a check to Doug Campbell, Broken Bone, Nebraska, for half of what your account is worth right now. And then I would expect an, a Christmas card at Christmas because I saved you half of your money and at least you knew where your money went to. Because if you're not willing to follow the rules and understand, I'm really serious about that. Now, obviously, I don't want your check. But what I'm trying to do is, is, is impress upon you, either you're willing to change or you're not. And if you're not willing to change, just plan on losing your money. If you're not willing to plan, if you're not willing to go through these steps, like that first thing that I showed you right at the beginning, OK? 
Okay. Don't bother me with the details. I'm busy. I don't have time for this. I'm busy. Don't give this stuff lip service and then not follow through. Follow through, plan your trades, be responsible. Remember, trading is a business. And if you don't treat it like a business, you're going to end up broke. You're more likely to end up living in your mother's basement than you are being successful if you choose not to change and choose to trade without rules and planning those positions. I know that's harsh, but I firmly believe that with all my heart and soul, guys, that it, it, because I, I did it myself. And you know what my coach said to me? My mentor, I was paying her. And we were going through my trades. And thinking back, I was acting like a moron. Where'd you enter this trade? Well, one of these days right in here. Oh, okay. Where was your stop? Yeah, somewhere around here. Did you set a stop? Well, no, I was just kind of using a mental stop on that. I, I knew it if it moved down into that area, I would probably get out of the trade. I did that on several trades and she said, turned to me and she said, Doug, I didn't think you were stupid. That's how she said it to me. I didn't think you were stupid, but I was acting stupid. And I thought that I was doing a good job but I was breaking every rule in the book because I wanted to believe it didn't apply to me. Stu, you're exactly right. You know, um, compete against yourself. Work to improve yourself every single month every single week, however you want to set that up. Work to improve yourself where you did a little bit better job in the trade. You improved, your win-loss ratio improved, your, your winning percentages improved, the money that you gained improved. Compete against you, not against other people. It's a big mistake. And you know, here's the cool thing. At least I think this is cool. The person that took this trade with one contract got the same percentage return than the person that took this with 20 contracts. And it was the same setup and it was the same plan. Once you get this down, all you have to do is scale it up. Once you can afford that bigger trade the more and, and more risk in the position because you've grown your account and your confidence comes up, all you have to do is scale it up. It's the same trade. You don't have to change up anything. You just continue to do the same thing. You stay in your pattern. Hey, that's awesome, Stu. Glad to hear that. Okay. So do yourself a favor. Get some accountability in your trading. Get yourself a plan. Plan those trades. And by the way, you might think this is just a long, drawn-out thing. Really, guys, it takes minutes. And if you look ahead in the chart and you set alerts on here, you can actually have your trade pretty much pre-planned, right? It doesn't take a lot of effort here. If you see this trade coming, say, hey, I can still take this trade. My stop loss is going to be in here. Yeah, that would be an acceptable risk. And then you just wait for the trade. You do it ahead of time rather than chasing it.
So it doesn't take much time. It should be part of every day what you're doing as you're going through looking for charts. You're preparing. You're waiting for the trades. You're looking for those positions that could be setting up. You're setting alerts and everyone knows. Everyone knows that I alerted everyone to this trade on both of these days. Because I waited for the trade. I prepared for the trade ahead of time. I could take a position in here with a low risk on the trade. Right? And it's the same pattern. It's the same pattern that Apple was. It's the same pattern that a lot of trades that we take. It's the same trade, just a different stock. Okay? So guys, I hope this was helpful and and this was just kind of a a, um, a a repeat of things that we've said over and over and over. But I wanted to add that emphasis to everyone. This is this is for all of us. This for, is for each of us. If we don't make these changes, if we don't follow a set of rules, then we're subject to our emotions. And we all know that if we trade emotionally and not trade as a business, we're going to get eaten up by the sharks out here in the market. We're the little tiny minnow swimming in a great big ocean full of sharks. And we have to be strategic and have a plan to prevent ourselves from being gobbled alive. Okay. Thank you guys for being here tonight. I truly appreciate it. We can we can continue to reinforce this um, over the days and you know weeks ahead. If you guys have any questions on that, please ask them during the live sessions. I'm happy to answer those. And look for those setups. Look for those trades. Make sure you plan that position. Have a set of rules and be accountable to them. Okay. And here's the last thing I want to say, as frustrating as trading can be, is don't give up. Don't give up. If an old carpenter out of Washington can figure this stuff out, anybody can. Trust me on that. I'm no genius. I'm no genius. But I, one thing I don't do anymore is I don't excuse myself from the work of being a trader. And that's following a set of rules and being disciplined. There's no excuse. I have to be the responsible one. Every single day, every single trade. Because if I don't hold myself accountable, who will? And no one cares about my money as much as I do. So I have to be the boss, the CEO, the last line of defense. The guy who makes that call, this is a good trade, this is not a good trade, walk away. Okay? Be that tough boss, you'll start to see your trading improve. All right. Everyone take care of yourselves. Have an awesome, awesome evening. I appreciate you being here. Truly do. And I will get this rendered and posted. Uh, you guys want me to post this on YouTube? Because I certainly can. Um, so you can watch it again. Happy to do that if you want me to. Okay, will do. Everyone take care. Have an awesome evening. We'll see you all bright and early tomorrow morning. Take care now. Rest well. Get some good sleep. We'll see you early. Take care.